Are you seeing elevated ferritin levels and wondering if copper could be responsible for this? My name is Dr. Taranella, and in this video, we're going to discuss the role of copper and how it may lead to elevated ferritin and elevated iron levels. We're also going to look at how it may lead to low iron levels and some testing you might want to do to check to see what your iron status is. Again, my name is Dr. Taranella. In this video, like all my videos, I make to help you go beyond basic health, but it's not made for any specific person. So please read this video disclaimer before we jump into the video details. So in this video, we're going to look at the role of copper in too much iron. Several people in the comments have suggested that copper is important in some key aspects of iron regulation and how it's used in the body. And they were right to suggest this, but how it shows up on your blood tests and how you might figure this out may not be as straightforward as it seems. So low copper levels can contribute to what appears to be too much iron, but it can also contribute to situations where there's too little iron as well. And how this shows up in your body and how it relates to your specific copper situation can be confusing. So that's what we're going to cover in this video. So first, we're going to look at the role copper plays in two specific areas, iron regulation and absorption via ferroxidase enzymes. And also, we're going to look at the role copper plays in inflammation and oxidative stress via superoxide dismutase. So first, the ferroxidase enzyme. So ferroxidase is an enzyme that converts Fe2 to Fe3. This Fe3 form of iron is a more stable and less likely to cause free radicals. There are ferroxidase enzymes in the gut inside the digestive cells, and they are needed to take that iron from inside the cell to get into the bloodstream. There's also ferroxidase enzymes circulating throughout the body, and that one's known as serulaplasm, and it circulates in the blood, and when you don't have enough copper, you won't be able to make either one of these enzymes. Now, you may still have some, but it's really relative to the abundance of copper. The less you have, the less efficient those enzymes are going to be, and the less production of those enzymes overall. So that's going to lead to more of the iron in a more unstable form. And when it's in that unstable form, you're going to get more inflammation occurring. So basically what happens is when that iron is in that unstable form, it's more likely to participate in this Fenton reaction. And Fenton reaction is what creates the free radicals in reactive oxygen species. And that contributes to this cascade of inflammation that can occur. That process is called ferroptosis, and I did go into some detail on that process in some of my other videos on excess iron and hemochromatosis. So the other enzyme I mentioned and is actually responsible for counteracting the oxidative stress created from the Fenton reaction is called superoxide dismutase, and this enzyme is a copper-dependent enzyme. So this is just another potential link between copper availability and inflammation. So how does all this really relate to too much iron or high ferritin or something like that in the blood? Well, oxidative stress and inflammation definitely go hand in hand, and those inflammatory signals are what's going to produce hepcidin. When you have elevated hepcidin, you're going to limit the amount of iron coming in from the digestive tract, but you're also going to promote sequestering of iron by white blood cells throughout the body. This is one of the body's defense mechanisms to protect itself from bugs floating around, infections, and other things. Because there's already inflammation present, it's going to try to limit the inflammation and limit the growth of microbes via sequestering all the iron. So the hepcidin enhances that sequesterization. And so we have two possible outcomes here. We have decreased absorption through the digestive tract, but we also have increased production of ferritin. And so both of these cases could be present just from not enough copper. So the relationship between copper, inflammation, hepcidin, and ferritin is actually kind of complex. But in summary, the way that it plays out is like this. When there's decreased copper, there's decreased activity in those ferroxidase enzymes like the seruloplasmin. And with that, there's going to be increased oxidative stress and inflammation. And with 
increased oxidative stress and inflammation. You're going to get increased hepcidin production, and the increased hepcidin production oftentimes will lead to increased ferritin. So it's important to point out that just because you have elevated ferritin levels does not mean you have decreased copper. And just because you have low copper levels doesn't mean you're going to have increased ferritin or increased inflammation from that source alone. So how do you know if you do indeed need more copper or have insufficient copper levels? Well, blood tests can be helpful in this case, but the levels in the blood may not necessarily reflect what your overall copper status is. So sometimes it's a good idea to triangulate this with multiple types of testing, but the normal range for your copper would be basically whatever the blood test reference range is, usually somewhere around 70 to 140 micrograms per deciliter is an appropriate range to look at. And so if that one looks slightly low or you're not sure due to various factors, the seruloplasmin level can also be checked. And if this level is low, we might consider this a stronger indicator of low copper status because we need copper to produce that enzyme and to have proper activity of that one plus the other ferroxidase enzymes. So with all this in mind, it's also important to point out that copper can be toxic and the ratio of copper to the other trace minerals like selenium and zinc and manganese is also important to balance that out. When you start taking one trace mineral alone by itself, it's going to offset the absorption of some of these other ones as well. So you want to keep a balance between these. If there's an obvious deficiency there, it's important to not overdo it with copper because, again, it can not only offset these other ones, you definitely can become toxic in copper as well. Some food sources of copper are going to be like organ meats and shellfish and mussels and oysters are high in copper and seeds and nuts are also decently high in copper. And as a point of reference, the RDA for copper, which shouldn't necessarily use as your upper limit, but just so you have a rough idea, 900 micrograms per day is the RDA for copper for most healthy adults. All right, so hopefully that gives you a better understanding of the role of copper and too much iron. If you do have questions about this topic, drop it in the comment section. I'm happy to answer your question. If you have a specific question and want a more customized, usable answer, consider joining the membership program. We'll all have more time and attention to dedicate towards your question. If you like this kind of information and want to continue getting videos like this, hit the like and subscribe button to keep getting these videos. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.